In the heyday of the Silicon Valley, they were even naming streets after this business, like Semiconductor Drive here in Sunnyvale. But of course, the heyday is over. And as fewer people buy computers and fewer computer companies buy chips, the slowdown spreads. What is the future of the high-tech business? We'll find out today as we continue our look at the slowdown in the Silicon Valley on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, we have here two new computers, very hot machines, the Atari 520ST, the Commodore Amiga, machines which everyone is praising for their good technology, their low price, and so on, yet analysts are saying neither of these machines may make it in today's computer marketplace. How bad is it? How difficult is it to bring out a new product now in this environment? Well, I think the key issue is just the one you mentioned, that's price. Uh, the Amiga is $1,500, mm -hmm. uh, the 520ST is $800. They both have Motorola 68K processor, a half mega memory, so it's a very capable kind of machine. In fact, it's at least as powerful as the, as the early IBM PC uh, computers mm -hmm. that came out. Now, the question is, how can they break into, those, into the market? Is the commercial market and the home market? The commercial market means word processing software, spreadsheets, graphics, all the things that are going to get them through the IBM stronghold. Uh, the home market, that's a more difficult target. Uh, they have to come up with software that people really want to use in the home. They've, they've already been past that technology sale a few years back. Now it's make the machine work. But basically, if these two guys can't make it at the prices they're talking about, we might as well hang it up. Really? <laughs> well, today we're going to look at part two of our special two-part look at the slowdown in the Silicon Valley. And today we'll focus on particular segments of the industry, looking at the software side, the hardware side, and the semiconductor business. And we'll get going in just a few seconds. Joining us now is Trip Hawkins. Trip was formerly with Apple, but now, of course, president of Electronic Arts, the software company. And sitting next to Trip is John Merson, vice president for marketing with Ashton Tate. Gary? Trip, there's been a lot of discussion about the computer slowdown, uh, but there's a recent article that came out that said software sales are up 60%. Why the contradiction? Well, actually, I think the industry has been going through a phase of consolidation, and overall this year has been uh, a slower growth year than what some people expected. Uh, I think there are three major reasons for that. I think, number one, that, that consumers are, are tremendously confused, and that's largely a function of uh, all the conflicting promises that have been made to them and all of the uh, bad news that they've heard about in the last few years, so that's not surprising. In fact, uh, in 1948, when CBS introduced the LP format for records for the first time, uh, RCA followed out with the 45 to compete with it, and the record industry went into a four-year slump. And that, that brings me to the second point. Everybody's sort of waiting to see what the result's going to yeah. be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the second point I was going to make is that uh, there's been a technology war going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year we get a few new models that are incompatible. And you have to wonder if, uh, if you would buy a new and improved television set if it didn't allow you to watch any of the current television shows. Uh, it creates uh, additional confusion and isn't re necessarily in the consumer's interest unless it is a fundamental technological breakthrough. And, and that finally, analogy basically is between well, things like the Amiga and the 520 that don't really have software that's compatible with the mm -hmm. old home machines. And yes, that that's absolutely right. right. Okay. And then finally, there's uh, been real chaos in the uh, channel of distribution for uh, computers and software, and mm -hmm. it's been going through a lot of change. Mm -hmm. Janet, when uh, Tripp mentioned the industry, are we really talking about two different situations? Is the software industry not in the same situation as the hardware industry? I think the software industry faces many of the same factors as the hardware industry. There are too many players trying to bring too much product to market, and the market, both the channels of distribution and the customers, really can't absorb it all. At the same time, 
people tend to buy software throughout the life of a system that they own. As they become more conversant with it, they tend to want to do more and more with it. So 84 was a fantastic year for hardware, and I think as those people mature in their understanding and use of their machines, they'll want more and more software. Well, what about, John, what about the, uh, the price erosion problem that we see in software? The, the problems of at least what I've seen you know, in my own personal experience of going through multi-channel distribution where the percentage uh, taken at each level is, is fairly high, and then we see that, that the prices at the retail level go down and down and down, and you get into, finally get to the point where you say, well, why should you even be in the business? Yeah, so you well, call it price erosion, so as a buyer, see, I like yeah, that. Right. That's <laughs> in your perspective, isn't it, sorry. Well, the irony is that um, in, in many ways, software prices have been moving up and defying gravity. Mm -hmm. We have software prices in a mass market right now for six and seven hundred dollars. That would have been unheard of just a couple of years ago. Another curious thing now, is... When you say the mass market, what do you mean by that? Do you mean a mass well, throughout uh, the, commercial market? Yes, throughout the, uh, the business software market, which covers 4,000 stores just across the U.S., um, we have software products selling at the $600 and $700 price point in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. Ashton Tate sold over 70,000 copies of uh, Framework last year. Um, I think uh, anybody a couple of years ago who would have been asked to make predictions for a $695 product would have thought that kind of number blue sky. Mm -hmm. But Trip, now if you're writing software, say, for something like the Mega at $1,500 for the basic hardware, isn't uh, it going to be kind of hard to sell a six dollars or $700 uh, software package to those people? Uh, yes, it will be. In fact, just to correct you, it's $1,295 for the basic hardware. And in mm -hmm. fact, I think that's the configuration that many people would buy initially. Without a monitor. Without a yeah. monitor. Because you can use it with uh, a television set mm -hmm. or any oh, okay. composite mm -hmm. video monitor. You don't have to buy the yeah. mm -hmm. uh, RGB monitor that they're offering, although that's a very nice monitor. But uh, most of the software for, for the Amiga, I think, will be priced uh, under $50. So how are you going to make money at $50? Uh, Direct sales, um, telemarketing? Obviously it has to be done on volume. Uh -huh. uh, I, think, I think prices coming down is obviously in the consumer's interest mm -hmm. uh, to the point uh, that uh, it allows the manufacturers of software and the creative people that are developing software to make enough money to continue to be attracted to being in that business. Now if you're going to be successful and these people that are, the people that are selling low-cost machines are going to be successful, what is going to have to be the installed base, let's say, uh, middle of 1986? or toward the end of 1986, let's say Christmas of 1986. Well, well, curiously enough, most of the software that we sell goes to new buyers, and many people buy a lot of their software when they buy their first machine. And right now, since the uh, distribution of software is such a confusing, jumbled uh, situation, uh, we're much more dependent on what retailers decide to carry than we are on the installed base. So we don't even think of it in installed base terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let me just ask one other question here. Now, this is uh, where a little bit of controversy may come up, but if we were to, let's say that the installed base was very large and Trip was very successful selling $50 software, would we see a $49.95 version of DBase 3? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll, we'll probably see $49 versions of some business software. In fact, we've already seen that. Companies like Borland have mm -hmm. brought desktop accessory software, which is in the business category, to market on a direct basis and also through, also through retailers at the under $50 price point. So it can happen. Uh, I think customers look at business software, though, not just what am I getting today and, um, and what can I do with it, but um, I'm making an, a major investment of my time and energy in, in learning this product and in putting my information into it. Um, that far outweighs the cost of the software package itself. And people want to be sure that the company that made the software is going to be around for a long time to support them. So there's much more brand consciousness. Brand meaning how strong is the company uh, behind the package. Speaking of how strong is the company, you've been involved, of course, in acquisitions and buying Multimate and so on. Is that a trend that's going to keep your end of this industry alive? Do you see more of that happening, a, a merger of all these software companies out there? Yes, I think so. Um, we are in a period of consolidation. There are too many software companies um, for the size of the market and its projected growth. Um, and we're probably past the point where a one product company, even a company with one very good product, can be viable on its own. And as these companies get together and share Salesforce, share distribution, share certain kinds of um, marketing know-how, um, they'll be stronger.
So there's a great incentive for everybody to do that. Mm -hmm. There's True. also a sense of integration of, uh, of products too that is, uh, is good for the customer. Well, the customers want products to talk to mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. What good is the greatest word processor in the world if I can't exchange data with the greatest database in the world? Customers are much more insistent now on software compatibility across a broad range of products. Mm -hmm. Now the question that we, we, as we've, we've talked about before is uh, what is it that's going to make make that home market? What, what kind of a product is going to make? It's not going to be probably a database program, right? Well, I have a theory about that. I think the three most important applications uh, at home are work, work at home, and homework. The work that you bring home from the office in your briefcase, the business that you run on the side or as your only business out of the house, and the homework that kids do in school. Those are very work-oriented markets. And I think um, when we have a significant installed base of personal computers in homes, we're probably going to see work-oriented software as one of the leading categories. And TRIPS very close to it. Trip, one, one last question. We're out of time. When you mentioned $50 software, which Electronic Arts will be turning out for the Amiga, you're talking about business software, not just games? I'm talking about all kinds of software for uh, uh, creativity, productivity, and entertainment. Although I think that the home market is going to be driven Historically, every uh, kind of consumer electronics product that has been purchased by the home has been purchased by men, just as personal computers have been, primarily for entertainment. And it's just a question of value. When they understand that the, the entertainment experience is dramatically different and profound and they really want it, then they're going to be willing to spend the money for it. Gentlemen, thank you. We're out of time for this segment of the show. Now, one of the companies you've heard an awful lot about in this slowdown in the Silicon Valley is Apple Computers, with reported layoffs and plant closings, shuffles in the executive suite, and so on. Our reporter, Wendy Woods, talked to several former Apple employees to see how the slowdown has affected them. Perhaps no other company symbolizes the dream of making it big in computers as Apple does, which is why the world quaked when Apple laid off 20% of its staff last summer. The dream seemed to have died, or at least been curtailed. But the dream didn't die with these ex-Apple managers. Dave Larson and Bill Cleary learned a wealth of lessons from Apple, which they've applied to their new company. Yeah, we're a lot more frugal now than we were. Dave and I remember when we rolled out the Apple IIc working on that project together, we spent over $2 million in one day. Now, we, we, could never, we couldn't do that in 10 years now, but we've become a lot more frugal. Bill and Dave's new company, International Solutions, markets unique Apple software and hardware from abroad and ships innovative American products overseas. Their products exploit mouse technology, which enables the Apple II to emulate a Macintosh. Demand for their products has been strong, and they're making good money for a startup without venture capital. These entrepreneurs see problems in the industry as opportunities for them. What I know now is that a lot of my friends who were there and a lot of people I've met throughout time in the industry, there's, I think, a real resurgence of the entrepreneur in the valley. A lot of people now are out working on various things, and a lot of those are going to bear fruit, and there will be a lot of new products and a lot of new product concepts and businesses which shake out of the valley in, in, in a new generation. So we're real positive and we tend to be bullish. We wouldn't be in this business working 16 hours a day if we thought the business was over. We think it's just going through its doldrum period and it's a transition period and, and that, you know, the, the business is very, very viable. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us now is Ben Annixter. Ben is the Vice President of Corporate Marketing at Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. Sitting next to Ben is Richard O'Brien, who is Corporate Economist with Hewlett Packard. Gary? Uh, ben, we just heard about the software industry not being in that bad a shape. Uh, what about the semiconductor industry? Is there a slump going on there? Well, there's been a severe slump in the semiconductor industry. Starting about last September, there was a very rapid slowdown in orders and shipments. Uh, which I think has about stabilized at this point, but we're down about 25 to 30 percent compared to this time last year. Now, is it the Japanese influence uh, that's caused that? Well, that's, that's one of the common um, concerns, but it's not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a tremendous inventory accumulation, which has had to have been worked off. Plus, there was a lot of over-optimistic forecasting, which resulted in a lot of companies buying stuff that they didn't need. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the PC industry, but in lots of other industries, too. 
Richard, uh, at HP, we've been talking earlier in this show and in the show we did last week about the home market, the business market, and HP is involved in a, a, lots of science and technical market and so on, and yet uh, lots of problems at HP with people taking forced days off and, and those kinds of cutbacks. Uh, how did this all affect Hewlett Packard, the slowdown? Well, I think the slowdown has probably been in effect about nine months now. Uh, I think that one of the things that you have to take a look at is that 1984 was a phenomenal year. And if you take a look at where we are today compared to 1983, the growth over that two-year period has been fairly good. Um, you have a case where people's anticipations for 1985 was more of a continuation of 1984. I think really 84 was more the anomaly than where we are today. Now in your business, you, you cover scientific and like I said, as Stuart was saying, commercial and personal computer and so forth. Where do you see the, the major decline? Well, the, we break it out into about four areas. Uh, you've got the instrument sector, the computer mm -hmm. sector, communications, and the semiconductor area. Uh, the weakest area by far is the semiconductor area. Uh, the computer area, that area is probably around flat. Uh, both the instrument and the communication sector are continuing to show reasonable growth. Mm -hmm. well, how are you going to pick up the computer part of it? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the industry, if you take a look at it right now, uh, is following along a slowdown that is true of all capital goods industries. Uh, our industry in the past has followed the capital goods industry. Uh, we are following it more or less a slump in the capital goods industry. When those customers start to be a little bit healthier, you'll see a recovery in the computer uh, portion of the market. Mm -hmm. Ben, you, you're with AMD, and one of the stories that we've read about in the papers and so on is about some of the excesses in this high-flying computer industry and the $100,000 Christmas parties and, the, and, and, and all the uh, elaborate things that used to go on in this business. Was, uh, did, did people overdo it and really get too, too aggressive and too fanciful in this industry? No, I don't think so. I think the uh, the hundred thousand uh, dollar Christmas parties, um, it was actually a lot more than that. But I think that's, <laughs> that's part of sharing the wealth, and we feel that uh, we we have a very loyal uh, employee base, and we want to reward them when times were good, and they stand behind us when times are bad. Um, as you probably know, we have a no layoff policy at AMD, and um, that's going to be very important for the upturn because then you don't have to train new people. You have people who understand their jobs and can pull us out of this upturn. Well, to be clear, no layoff, but I mean, you do furlough people when business is down. I mean, they, they, they don't work for a while and don't get paid. Yes, we have short, we have had short work weeks, but that's the way that we all share in the bad times as well as the good. Mm -hmm. now, one of the things that happens uh, from an outsider uh, looking at the chip industry, that uh, once a particular part, let's say a, a memory chip, turns out to be something that anyone can build, then it goes over across the ocean and it's built over in Japan, for example, at a very low cost. And so one way we get, uh, I guess, of our advantage is we innovate and we come up with new ideas and so forth for, for new chips, new processes, things of that sort. What is AMD looking for in terms of innovation? What kind of areas are you getting into? Well, I, I think, Gary, that uh, the whole part of the product line is important. You can't build a computer with just memory chips. Mm -hmm. You have to have innovative other products that make the memories work. And actually, the memory business is only about 20% of the total semiconductor business. And the thing that separates the companies that customers want to deal with are the ones who can make the innovative products. And so those are networking chips, uh, graphics display chips, microprocessors, uh, peripheral chips that really make the, the memory parts sing. Okay, now we, we hear in the, in, the, in the industry a lot about local area networks becoming very, very important and graphics being an important part of computer systems. Now, from a chip standpoint, you probably see that demand. Do you see the demand growing very rapidly, or is this more speculation that graphics and networking is going to be important? No, it, it's not speculation. It, it turns out that in, in revolutions or evolutions as large as this thing, it takes a long time to get this thing going. And we talk to the customers who are designing these things now, which are going to be production realities a year down the road, sometimes six months mm -hmm. down the road, sometimes two or three years down the road. Will this be the sort of thing, like let's say local area networks, for example, where we're going to see some, so some of the things that will offset this decline right now? Well, there's two things about the decline. First of all, nobody likes uh, lower, lower levels of business. Mm -hmm. But in this particular decline, and in many declines, uh, prices go down very rapidly 
And in our business, we have a, uh, a business where these lower prices stimulate the demand for uh, new applications for these products. And that's what you're going to see the next time around. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the innovative products, such as the things that are being made at AMD, we have a very strong push on innovative products. Uh, that's the thing that creates the new applications. Mm -hmm. Richard, do you see any permanent changes taking place in the computer industry uh, because of the slowdown that everybody's going through now? I mean, the way companies are run, will people be more conservative, less willing to take risks, and so on? I don't think that's going to happen as far as be people becoming less conservative in the long run. Uh, people's planning horizon, certainly for this next year, may be a little bit more conservative because we're sort of what we'd say walking along the bottom. Uh, Things aren't deteriorating, but things haven't started to turn around yet. Uh, indications are, as far as our leading indicators go, think that things will, but I think people are going to be fairly conservative, say, for this next year. They're going to really want to see some proof that things have turned around. But I don't think it means for a long-term permanent shift. We have just about a, a minute left. Ben, Gary, I think, mentioned briefly the Japanese situation. And, and a lot of times in the press, the comparisons have been made and the other industries which have moved offshore, moved to Japan, moved to Asia, and so on. Uh, is there a, a long-term serious problem here in this business in terms of our losing control of this industry? Well, I, I think that when you realize that innovation is the thing that drives this industry, uh, you can compete if you can integrate, if you can innovate. Um, Manufacturing or assembling offshore is simply a way to, to maintain your competitiveness in the international marketplaces. The innovation and the brain power that makes these new chips is the things that's going to keep uh, America and um, our side uh, in good shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Now, what will happen in the future and what lessons have we learned from the past? We have some thoughts from our commentator, Paul Schindler. Thank you, sir. Want a pencil? Uh, listen, now things haven't really gotten this bad in Silicon Valley, at least not for me personally, at least not yet, but some people say it's just a matter of time. Well, it's my job to be a contrarian, so I'm going to tell you that things are going to get better. Nothing lasts forever. The good times of 84 were an aberration, but so were the bad times of 85. The real long-term growth potential of the computer and electronics businesses lies somewhere in between these extremes. A lot of people, led, I'm sorry to say, by some of my colleagues in the media, want you to think there's something fundamentally different about this recession, that it marks a complete restructuring of the computer and electronics business. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think so. In fact, I think nothing could be farther from the truth. Everyone's favorite analogy is the auto industry. You know, there were once 50 U.S. car companies. Now there's just four. And they say the same thing's going to happen in computers? I don't believe it. Cars are not computers, and vice versa. A car just helps you get around. A computer thinks. Getting around is common. Thinking is unique. Until we are all thinking the same, we're going to have a multi-vendor computer industry. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. random access file this week, it looks more and more like Steve Jobs will be starting a new computer venture. After selling off $14 million worth of Apple stock last month, Jobs this week announced he'll sell off another $7 million worth. Some analysts are predicting Jobs will soon sell all his Apple stock and then launch a new startup. There was bad news for Apple this week in a market study done by a Connecticut research firm. Here are the figures. They show a dramatic drop in business plans to buy Apple computers, including the Macintosh, and a big jump in plans to buy IBM. The other big losers appear to be Radio Shack, Commodore, and Hewlett Packard. IBM kept up the pressure this week, announcing an 11% price cut on the floppy version of the XT. A one-drive floppy XT will now sell for under $2,000. The recent IBM-Microsoft deal to further develop systems software based on the PC-DOS standard appears to be a major blow to Unix and AT&T. One InfoCorp analyst says the IBM-Microsoft deal puts another nail in the coffin of Unix in the single-user desktop world. Meanwhile, there were signs that even AT&T might be abandoning Unix. A company called Alloy Computer Products of Massachusetts announced that AT&T is buying its new card that allows the Unix PC to run PC-DOS software. AT&T reportedly will put the card in the Unix PC to make it a hybrid in an effort to boost sales. Who is the biggest computer user of all? The United States government. It's been mainly mainframes in the past, but now even Uncle Sam is getting into micros. Sales of PCs to the feds were up 400% last year, according to a just-released GSA report. The U.S. government bought nearly 38,000 PCs, the most successful PC vendor to the government, IBM. Paul Schindler back now with this week's software review. Like me, you may have thought that this was the ultimate in trivia. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that it isn't. Now, some of you may have tried computerized trivia games, only to be turned off by their, well, their triviality. I mean, let's face it. How many different ways can you play and score games that really amount to nothing more than recall of random facts? Well, I can't answer that question, but I can tell you about Ultimate Trivia, a game that's captured my heart. I play it for 15 or 20 minutes every day, and as they say, it's trivia that pursues you. You can't get away from the color graphics in this game, some of which are really rather cute. It begins, innocently enough, with the info grid. As you answer questions, you reveal the ultimate graphic. You get four choices, but just three chances in each category, so sometimes you don't get to see the whole graphic. Then there's another round. Which of these four things go together? And another graphic. Score more than a thousand and three regular rounds, and you get to the bonus round. A real killer. Now, let's just say that I get to the start of the bonus round every day, but never much further. And, as if Ultimate Trivia was not enough, there's now an Ultimate Trivia version, too. Both are just $50 from Mentor Learning Systems in Santa Clara, California. Both could drive you crazy. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. The University of Illinois at Urbana will be conducting an experiment in the use of computers on campus. In a special deal with IBM, the university will install 125 IBM PCs in one of its dorms. That will be one computer, monitor, and printer in every room, about $700,000 worth in all. The university will then study the students to see how computers change their academic and their personal lives. UC Berkeley has just completed a study of how grade school students feel about computers and the results were a bit surprising. 61% of the students said they did not like computers. Most said that kids who did like computers were, quote, unpopular. The study concluded that the stereotype of the computer nerd is alive and well in America's grade schools. Finally, if you had any doubt about the importance of the spectacular sound and graphics capabilities of the new Commodore Amiga and the Atari ST, listen to this. The new technology has enabled new versions of some classic games to come out. In the new deluxe pinball construction set, you can hear the sound of the ball ricocheting off the computer-generated bumpers in stereo. And in the new one-on-one, -on -one, not only do Dr. J and Larry Bird move more smoothly than before, but when Julius makes a quick move on the bird, you can hear his sneakers squeal on the gymnasium floor. Now, folks, that's high tech. And that's it for this week's edition of the Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard.